Hey everybody, thanks for watching. We're going to do something a little bit different in this video than we've done in the other videos. We're still going to look at a New Testament text in light of its Old Testament background, but we're also going to delve a little bit into, into history. We're going to talk about two of the groups that were frequently in opposition to Jesus, namely the scribes and the Pharisees. So who were the scribes? Who were the Pharisees? Where did they come from? What did they believe? And why so often did they stand in opposition to Jesus? So we're going to look at this historical background, and then after that, we're going to look a little bit at the parable of, especially of the lost sheep, to help us get its connection to its Old Testament background, especially from the book of Ezekiel. So first of all, let's talk for a minute about the scribes, which in Hebrew would be called the Sophorim. Now, we might not realize this, but actually in the Old Testament itself, there are frequent references to the Sophorim, to the scribes. It seems that early on, those that we know as Sopharim were sort of what you might think of as a secretary of state. They were those who were under authority and they were charged, especially in sort of national or military matters to carry out the dictates of their superiors. Now in later biblical history, by the time we get, for instance, to the book of Ezra, those who were known as Sopharim, the scribes, were those especially who were entrusted with the preservation and the teaching and the application of the law. So Ezra, for instance, is the most famous Sopharim of the Old Testament. He was the one who was in charge with teaching the Torah to Israel or the leadership of the people. He was highly skilled in the interpretation of the scroll of the sacred scrolls from God. There's also mention in the Old Testament of Baruch, who was the secretary or the scribe of the prophet Jeremiah. So Ezra and Baruch are probably two of the most famous of the Sopharim of the Old Testament. So the Sopharim, by the time we get to the first century, time of the New Testament, were the educated aristocracy, if you will. These were the closest we could come to is describing as something like the professional trained theologians of the day. They were the ones who were the most highly skilled in understanding and interpreting and then applying the laws of the Torah to the people. And even though we get the impression from the New Testament that these were like the bad guys, in the eyes of most of the first century Jewish population, the scribes were highly esteemed. They were the teachers of the people. They were the experts. They were the ones who knew the Torah backwards and forwards. They were the ones who were entrusted with the teaching of all of the intricacies of the Jewish law. So we have evidence, for instance, in some later rabbinical stories that the scribes were actually held in higher esteem than the high priest himself. There's one story in the rabbinical literature of how the people were once in a procession with the high priest and a couple of famous scribes came along and the people left the high priest and they, they followed the scribes instead. So these Sophorim, these scribes, were first of all educated and second of, all, second of all, they were esteemed by the people and they were the ones who were entrusted with the sacred duty of reading, of copying, of transmitting, and of teaching and applying the laws to the people of Israel. So that's who the scribes were. And of course, one of the reasons they stood in opposition to Jesus was because very frequently Jesus's interpretation or his application of the laws of the Torah were different than that of the scribes. So a lot of what's going on is a debate over the proper understanding of the scriptures between the Sophorim, the scribes, and, and Jesus. So at the beginning of Luke chapter 15, when it says that the Pharisees and the scribes were upset with Jesus because he was receiving sinners and eating with them, we can kind of understand a little bit of the background as to why the Sophorim were, were opposed to Jesus. Now, secondly, the Pharisees, who were they? Well, the Pharisees in Hebrew were the Parashim, which is from the verb parash, which means to, to separate, to distance oneself. So the Pharisees, or the Parashim, were the separated ones. The first evidence that we have of the existence of the Pharisees is from the 2nd century BC, 
in the books known as 1st and 2nd Maccabees, which in some Bibles is part of what's called the, the Apocrypha. This tells the story of the Jewish rebellion against the Greek hegemony and how the leaders of, especially the family of the Maccabees, were able to establish, at least for a short time, some independence of the Jews. So we have evidence uh, from 1st and 2nd Maccabees that the Pharisees existed then. So the Pharisees were a, were a brotherhood, if you will, a, a religious community that distinguished itself from other groups, such as the, such as the Sadducees. We know from a first century Jewish historian by the name of Josephus, who has left us a, a wealth of literature, that in his day anyway, he describes three different, what he calls philosophical schools, or three different groups of Jews, Jewish uh, religious societies, if you will. And one of these we learn about also from the New Testament, that is the Sadducees. The Sadducees, Sadducees were primarily the, the priestly aristocracy. And then we have the Pharisees also described by, by Josephus. And the third group that's described by Josephus is, are the Essenes, uh, which we often associate with the Essene community near the Dead Sea, which we presume were the ones who gave us the Dead Sea Scrolls. So Josephus describes these three different religious groups that he himself was actually acquainted with and knew their teachings and had actually been involved in these groups, the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the Essenes. So Josephus actually was a Pharisee himself. He's one of the most famous of the Pharisees. Uh, some of the other famous Pharisees from the first century besides Josephus would have been the Rabbi Gamaliel, who, as we know from the book of Acts, was the teacher of the apostle Paul before he was an apostle. And Paul himself, back when he was known as Saul, was another Pharisee. And of course, we know that Nicodemus from the Gospel of John was a Pharisee as well. Josephus gives us one estimate that in his day, there were approximately 6,000 Pharisees in the city of Jerusalem. Well, we're not sure how accurate that number is, but there were a fair number of Pharisees. And they were part of this uh, community, this, this brotherhood. Now, one of the things that distinguished the scribes and the Pharisees is that, yes, some, some of the Pharisees were themselves scribes. They were kind of the educated elite of the day. But not all scribes are Pharisees and not all uh, Pharisees were, were scribes. Some of the Pharisees were simply common people who had pledged themselves to a life of piety that exceeded that which would have been expected of and required of, of a common Israelite. So we often read that the Pharisees, in, in the literature about Pharisees, we often read that the Pharisees wanted to establish a, a true Israel, if, if you will. Uh, it's often described as sort of a, a democratization of the priestly requirements of those who served at the temple. So that the requirements of the priest with regard to dress, the requirements of the priest with regard to the various purity laws and what they could or they couldn't eat, all of those were then assumed as a responsibility also of the Pharisees. So they, they were the exemplars of piety, if you will. They were the ones who in their, in their individual lives and in their family lives tried to replicate the higher levels of purity and sanctity that were required of the priest who served at the temple. So they were trying to take the, the priestly life and then to apply it to their own hearth and home, if you will, to establish a true Israel in which not just the priests were living this kind of elevated life of sanctification, if you will, but also that they themselves were, were living this. Now, as you might expect, with that kind of a with that kind of approach to a life of piety, they had to draw lines between who they were and who other people were. And these lines often separated them from certain groups so that they wouldn't have anything to do with them. Uh, one of these is referred to in the literature as the, the Am Ha'aretz, which literally is, in Hebrew, is the people of the land. But Am Ha'aretz uh, took on a pejorative sense meaning those who were sort of the, the uneducated, rustic people who didn't follow the, the laws of the Torah, or the Am Ha'aretz who didn't follow as, as rigorously the laws of the Torah as the Pharisees would have, would have had them do. So the Pharisees were this religious association 
that had its roots already in the second century BC, as we learned from the books of the Maccabees. And by the time we get to the first century, there were numerous Pharisees. Uh, some of them were part of the Sanhedrin. Some of them were scribes. Not all of them were scribes. So some of them were, were highly educated and in, leader, in positions of leadership, and some of, them, some of them were not. But they were understood to be this, this closely knit religious association that took as its aim the elevation and the expansion of the purity laws of the priesthood and the temple to their own lives as well. And so you can understand with kind of this background as to why they were opposed to Jesus, why they were especially upset with his close association with those groups known as the sinners or the tax collectors. Now, what's fascinating about the Pharisees is that after the destruction of the temple in AD 70, so after you didn't have a temple anymore, you didn't have really a, an, an officiating priesthood offering sacrifices anymore, it was the Pharisees who would establish really what became known as kind of the foundation of, of Judaism. If you have no temple anymore, you have no priesthood, and you thus have no sacrifices, you have no means of atonement. So what happened after the destruction of the temple is that you, ha you entered into the era of what's referred to usually as rabbinic Judaism, in which there was much more of a focus upon not sacrifices, because you couldn't sacrifice anymore, but the study of the text about the sacrifices. And so there are uh, many rabbinic arguments and discussions about how, how, do, how do we receive atonement now? How do we receive forgiveness? Well, you can't offer sacrifices anymore. And so atonement or forgiveness or purification or sanctification was achieved not by going to a temple and offering a sacrifice, but actually by studying the sacred text about the temple and the sacrifices. So there's much more of a shift to from a kind of a, a pre-AD 70 temple-centered, uh, uh, sacrificial-centered life among the Jews to a very book-focused, to a very study-focused life. And that was established really through the influence of the Pharisees. So the Pharisees then become the, the ones who kind of not reinvented, but they, they gave a, a very different focus to, to the life of, of the Jews to where they became much more of a, of a book-centered, study-centered religion. And that's why, for instance, the synagogues became so crucial because these were the, that was the, the Beit Midrash, that was the, the house of study for, for the Jews. So the Pharisees were, in many, many people's eyes in the first century, they were, they were the good guys. So it, it's just kind of a kind of a, a strange change that takes place over time. So like today, we think of good Samaritans, and when we think of Pharisees, we think bad. So good Samaritans, bad Pharisees. In the first century, it'd be exactly the opposite. The, the Samaritans would be the bad guys, and the Pharisees would be the good guys. So these were the examples of piety for the people. So if the scribes were sort of the educated aristocracy, those who were more into, into, into learning and into teaching. The Pharisees were much more men of practice. They were the ones who wanted to incorporate all of these purity laws into their own life piety. So anyway, that's a, that's a bit of a background about the Sofarim, the scribes, who date all the way back to the Old Testament. And then the Parashim, the Pharisees, the separated ones, who wanted to establish this true Israel and to expand out the priestly requirements to all of the people. And then, of course, we laid the foundation for rabbinic Judaism after the destruction of the temple. Now, with all that as a background, uh, let's take a look for just a minute at what's going on in Luke chapter 15. We learn that the Sophorim and the Parashim, the scribes and the Pharisees, were upset with Jesus because he was receiving sinners and eating with them. This was a matter of table fellowship. So the Pharisees drew very strict lines as to who they would associate with, and they would never sit down at a meal, either as an invited guest or as a host, with someone who was part of the, the Am Ha'aretz, this pejorative term for the uneducated, rustic people of the land who didn't keep the laws of the Torah, or sinners. And sinners were those who were either engaged in some sort of immoral lifestyle, such as the prostitutes, 
or those who didn't keep the, the laws of the Torah, or who were sinners were also sometimes described as those who were in certain kinds of proscribed occupations, such as tanners and donkey drivers and shepherds as well. Now, mentioning shepherds, that leads us into the parable. We don't probably consider this, but when Jesus starts off in his discussion with the Pharisees by saying, which of you... If he has a hundred sheep and loses one of them, doesn't seek out the one that's lost. Well, Jesus is, is responding directly to the Pharisees. So when he calls them through this parable shepherds, he's already insulting them, if you will, because the shepherds of the first century were classified as those who were in one of these occupations that was unclean that was was not a, a shepherd would not be someone that a pharisee would even eat a meal with much less one he wanted to be connected with so when jesus uh when he addresses the pharisees when he when he refers to them through this parable of shepherds he's already insulting them if you will he's already as we say today triggering them by this reference to them as shepherds so jesus says in this parable if you are a shepherd and you have hundred sheep and you and you, and you lose one of them then you go seek it out and when you find it you put it over your your shoulders and you rejoice and then when you get home you throw a big party in celebration of finding your lost sheep now anyone who's familiar with the old testament is realizes right away that what jesus is doing is he is he's using a very common image from the old testament of course we have shepherds throughout the old testament moses was a shepherd david was a shepherd and kings themselves were sometimes referred to as, as shepherds, those who shepherded the people that they were in charge of. Now, the, the key passage for understanding the parable of the lost sheep is from the book of Ezekiel, because Ezekiel tells us in chapter 34 that Yahweh himself will search out, he will seek out his lost sheep and bring them home. He will bind up their wounds. He will take care of them. He will feed them. And in this same context in Ezekiel 34, there's a, an attack against those who were not taking care of the sheep, those who were scattering the flock, those who were not fulfilling their duties as shepherds. And so that's kind of the background of what Jesus is saying here to the scribes and to the Pharisees in Luke chapter 15, that they had failed in the duty because they were attacking Jesus because he was associating with the sinners and with the tax collectors with those who were not in any way associated with the Pharisees. They'd kind of just let them be lost. And Jesus says, you're not fulfilling your vocation. You're not pursuing the lost sheep, which is exactly what you, were, what you should be doing, what God would have you do. And so Jesus, by using this parable, is not only attacking the Pharisees, but he's also describing who he is. He is the one who, as Ezekiel 34 goes on to say, he is the David, he's the new David, who comes to seek out the lost sheep and to shepherd them. And not only that, but when he seeks out the lost, this lost sheep to, to, to carry it home and to rejoice even in the burden of carrying this sheep home. And then to have this grand celebration when he finds his lost sheep and brings it back to, to his community. What Jesus is really describing here is his way of talking about repentance. Now, in the, in the, in the, in the rabbinic mindset, as we learn from later rabbinic texts, uh, repentance, or teshuva, as, as the Jews call it, was sort of meeting God halfway. Repentance was, a, was an act of atonement. Repentance was a precondition for, for grace. So repentance was, was very much understood as a human action, which, is, which, which was obligatory upon the sinner in order to achieve atonement. Now, in Jesus' rendering of repentance, it, it's very different because repentance is basically equivalent with being found. So the, 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 the sheep, the lost sheep that's repentant is the lost sheep that is found. So repentance is not so much an action that the sheep performs as a gift which the shepherd bestows. So the shepherd, in finding the sheep, is bringing this lost sheep to repentance. That is, he is bringing it home. He's returning it which is kind of the connotation of the Hebrew word for repentance, to turn or to return. So God repents this lost sheep. That is in the sense of bringing it home, of returning it where it belongs. So in, in Jesus' 
telling of this parable, he's also telling about repentance, which is God's action in seeking this lost sheep and bringing it back to the fold and rejoicing to do so. So I know this video has been a little bit longer than, than the other videos. Uh, I hope that you're still with me and I hope that you've, that you've learned a little bit about the Sofarim, the scribes, the Perishim, the Pharisees, and also about Ezekiel 34 and its background to the parable of the lost sheep. So as always, thank you so much for watching and for all your words of encouragement. And I pray that as you, as you meditate upon this text, as perhaps you hear it preached on Sunday, that you will better understand exactly who the scribes are, who the Pharisees are, who these sinners are, and how Ezekiel 34, the Old Testament, presents us with the background of the parable of the lost sheep. So thanks again and have a blessed day.